everybody. How are you? We are welcoming everybody to our series called MS Conversations Now. And on this series, we have a doctor, Okai. She's here from Dallas, Texas. All right. And we have a patient, Jill Moberger, who will be speaking with Dr. Okai today about conversate different things that we addressed in our in our series in different portions of the country, all of course virtually right now. But before I begin this program, before I tell you any bit more about it, I want to thank our sponsors, our supporters of today's program. And as you can see on the screen behind me, it's pretty clear. We have Novartis and we have Bristol Myers Squibb. And virtually, we want to give them a round of applause. Everybody say yay. Good. Thank you. Okay. We have a bunch of people online right now getting ready for this program to begin. All right. Again, we have Dr. Okai. We have Jill Moberger, she's our patient advocate. And also I, also, I did want to tell you, though, that we have digital exhibitors for today's event. And those digital exhibitors are Biogen. We have, um, who else do we have there? We have Biogen, we have Novartis, and we have Genentech, okay? So we just want to let you know that. All right, now getting to the program. So Dr. Okai and Jill are going to have a conversation with each other. And we have some questions that we've already fielded from the audience. But for anybody that's online now, you could go to the box on the right side of your page. I believe it is there. And you just click on the questions button and you write in your questions of what you want to ask that is relative to what they are speaking about. And then after like each topic, they're going to ask me if there's any questions that are pending for each of those topics. Okay. So we're going to get started on this. And I just want to tell you that Dr. Akai is the founder and medical director of the Multiple Sclerosis Treatment Center of Dallas at Baylor University Medical Center. She, Dr. Okai, is fellowship trained in multiple scler sclerosis. Wow, can you imagine I'm having a hard time saying that? She's fellowship trained in multiple sclerosis. She uses a multidisciplinary approach to manage all stages of multiple sclerosis. It's also known as MS when you're not all tongue-tied, okay? So we are gonna get started with this program. I'm gonna say hello, Dr. Okai is here. You could see her. Hey, Dr. Okai, how are you doing over there? You're on mute. Great. There Thanks you go. for having now, me, Stuart. Fantastic. All right, and we have Jill Moberger, and you can see her as well, and you have to take yourself off of mute, and then I'm going to go to mute, and you will see me intermittently asking questions, okay? So, ladies, Thanks get started on your program. Say hello to each other. Hi, Dr. Okai. Good to see you. Hi, Jill. We're going to start with a talk about progression. Good to see MS you. Progression. It's great to be here. Um, first, I want to ask you a little bit about progression. Can you talk about progression, please, and, and tell us what it is? Okay. So, first, progression is is um, for MS patients can be a scary uh, a topic, but we'll try to make sense of it today. So. When we talk about progression in MS, we are talking about um, having new symptoms or worsening symptoms that impact someone's function. For an example, if someone uh, was walking and had a slight uh, a weakness in the leg, and over six months or years time, they start to drag that leg a little bit. And, and then a few months later, they start to need a cane. That is considered progression. Now, another way someone can progress is if they have a relapse. And after the relapse, uh, about six months later, we actually give them about six months to recover from their relapse. And after that relapse, they still have residual symptoms that affect the function, then we consider that a progression of the MS. Um, another uh, uh, thing that is also a little bit confusing is that MS is divided into relapsing form and progressive forms. So uh, we have to also distinguish before that uh, between those two forms. So relapsing, patients have relapses, they have a period of recovery and they're stable and then they have a relapse and then they have a period of recovery again. Whereas progressive form of MS, they have an event and they continue to go downhill and they never have a period of recovery of stability. 
So those are uh, uh, those are the contexts in which we use progression in MS. Okay, so uh, when uh, someone develops a new symptom, they're always concerned, does this mean I'm progressing, Dr. Kai? And I said, well, let's see if we employ all our treatment for relapses, if we employ our rehabilitative, uh, rehabilitative services, and you uh, recover that, that does not mean progression. It's after we employ all of those uh, strategies, and it's about six months, and you still have, uh, symptoms remaining that impact your function, we, we consider that progression of disease. If um, a patient has a relapse and they recover, do they recover to the same place that they were previously? So um, a majority of patients can recover to where they were previously, so we call it returning to their baseline. And then there is another group of patients that they don't fully recover. So normally in my practice, after a relapse and after I've treated the patient, I said, give me a percentage. How close are you to where you were before your baseline? If your baseline were, was 100% before this, do you think you have recovered 100 percent? You're back to where you were before your relapse, or do you think you still have some residual symptoms? Is it 50 percent back? Is it 75 percent back? Is it 95 percent back? So ideally, we want relapses to uh, 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 be resolved and patient go back to their baseline as close as possible, over 90 to 95 percent back. But there are times when patients do not fully recover. What can a patient do to slow the progression? Well, so um, the first thing is to uh, be compliant and adherent to their disease modifying therapy, so their MS medication. We know uh, there have been lots of studies that show that these medications slow progression of disease. So we try to encourage patients to take the medication as prescribed. And if there are issues with taking the medication, if they're having difficulty uh, adhering to one therapy, is something that they should talk to their provider about and say, uh, I'm having problems sticking to this therapy because if you don't take the therapy, as prescribed, then it's not going to work as it should. So the first thing is being adherent to therapy and compliant with your medication. And then the second thing is lifestyle. So I tell uh, my patients, it's, you know, we have this partnership and this partnership is a 50-50 partnership. I have to prescribe the medication for you to uh, 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 slow down the progression of your disease. And then your part, your 50% part, is the lifestyle changes. So lifestyle changes mean eating healthy. And, and over the years, I've realized that it's, it's just not enough to say, go and eat healthy. Because most people need help defining what eating healthy is. So I try to incorporate or give them uh, information about what healthy eating is like and what foods affects, affect MS. So a healthy eating uh, all helps uh, uh, the overall well-being and control some of the symptoms of MS. Smoking, if someone is a smoker, I encourage them to uh, uh, quit smoking because smoking has been studied in MS and it has shown that it can worsen the symptoms of MS, it can worsen relapses, make relapses go, long, uh, uh, go longer, uh, having the right amount of supplementation, and, and then also being physically active. So the healthy living part is the 50% part that patients have to do that can help uh, their overall quality of life and help slow uh, their progression along with the disease modifying therapy. Can progression ever be reversed? Can progression ever be reversed? This, this is the... Uh, the burning question, because if we can do that, you know, most patients will be happy.
so without disease modifying therapy, what we tell patients is that we have, I'm giving you this medication is to slow disease progression. But there have been lots of advances now in, in our therapies. And now what, uh, what we are looking at with these medications is, okay, can we see some improvement in our patients when they do take this? And there are um, uh, uh, a few therapies that we have now that have shown what we call a clinically definite improvement. While that is not the major factor for these medication, that's what we are starting to look at and that's what we are starting to see. And that's what we are pushing towards that our therapy help patients improve and and go past beyond keeping them stable. You talk some about uh, lifestyle changes, um, diet and exercise. How about aging? Is aging a factor in terms of progression? Aging is a factor. So uh, people who have lived with MS for a long time um, tend to think back to the time when they were younger and they were able to do things. But we have to realize that as we age, our cells also age along with us. And it's, it's just a normal part of aging. So your brain also ages. You don't have as much reserve as you were at 20 compared to 50. And with the decrease in your reserve, your brain reserve, as we call it, you it takes a longer time to recover. It takes a longer time to do things. And it takes a longer time for the body to adapt to different changes. So aging is a factor. And sometimes uh, we also have to remind uh, patients that, OK, that pain you're feeling and that difficulty that you're having walking probably due to knee pain may not all be MS. It may be, you know, because you are aging and not while well, your MS is progressing. So we also have to uh, change. Um, we also have to figure out is this due to MS, is this due to the normal process of aging? As we grow older, there are other diseases and other conditions that occur. So uh, one thing we ha I remind patients is that even though you have MS, that does not mean that you cannot get any other condition or any other disease. Okay, so um, if patients have other what we call comorbid factors, if they have diabetes, if they have high blood pressure, those things can also affect the MS symptom, it can affect the overall, the healthiness of their body cells and their brain cells. And that can cause a stress as well on this system. And that can impair some uh, um, uh, 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 healing of, and, and encourage progression. So we really try to make sure that all other conditions that patients are experiencing, that they are well controlled as well. Dr. Akai, can you talk some about MS symptoms, both physical and cognitive symptoms? Okay, great. So uh, MS is the unpredictable disease and it affects uh, a whole lot of systems in the body. And so I, I always uh, like to use the term, the tip of the iceberg. So when someone with MS have physical symptoms that is visible to the eye, it's easy to see that they have MS, you know that they have MS and they have some limitations. So patients with canes and walkers, you can say, okay, yeah, I have MS and people will understand that. So those are physical symptoms that you can see, but there are lots of other symptoms that can impact people. So we have the invincible symptoms of MS. And what are those symptoms that are invincible that people who do not know that you have MS may not see? So fatigue is one, okay? Fatigue is a major issue. Fatigue isn't something that you wear on your sleeves or on your face, you know? Fatigue, MS fatigue hits all at once and 
patients are tired and some people may not understand that. Other symptoms that they may occur may be block, uh, bowel and bladder symptoms. So, uh, and that is very uh, debilitating just as much as someone who has ambulatory, ambulatory dysfunction. Imagine if he had to go to the, uh, to the uh, restroom uh, every 30 minutes or every hour. That really impacts social activities. That really impacts how, how people go about their day-to-day -day lives and they start to cut back on 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 activities that they mean uh, that they like doing so it's just that's debilitating numbness and tingling and internal vibrations so all of those symptoms that are not seen are called the invincible symptoms but can have a major impact on patients lives as well so that was the physical part of it and that was just the tip of the iceberg, literally. I only gave a few, but there are so many other symptoms that we can go through. Now, cognitive symptoms are, is also an invincible symptom. And cognitive symptoms can also be very debilitating. So difficulty with thought processing, that is major. So uh, someone who has a, a, a difficulty processing, if they have information coming to them all at once, it really overwhelms them and they cannot process as well. And that can be very frustrating. Word finding difficulty, that's another thing. Uh, most MS patients call it the tip of the tongue syndrome. They know what they want to say is right there and they just can't bring it out. You know, memory issues, memory is also one. I, I, I went and I forgot. Now, everyone have a little bit of memory issue. Well, I went into the kitchen and I forgot what I went into the kitchen for and I have to walk back out and come back in. But memory uh, memory issues that's really impacting lifestyle is, well, I had this conversation with my husband and I didn't remember it. Uh, 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 10 or 15 minutes later. So uh, uh, those are some of the things that can impact a uh, 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 patient's life, both physically and cognitively overall. And, and there are ways to address these. But once again, it's something that you have to talk to your physician about and, and see how that can be addressed. How do you know um, whether these invisible symptoms, whether physical or cognitive, are MS and not aging or not something else? Great. So let's take the example of fatigue, the main one that I talked about. So fatigue is a very tricky one for the patient and for the physician. So the first thing is uh, there are lots of reasons for fatigue. Let's start with the, the number one thing is sleep. So when someone tells me, Dr. Kai, I am having so much fatigue, I can't even keep my eyes open during the day. The first question is, how are you sleeping at night? I don't just assume that this is all MS. Um, so if someone isn't sleeping well at night and not getting the restful sleep for the body to rejuvenate, they're going to be tired the next day. If someone has depression, which is major, is a major comorbidity with MS patients. So it goes along with MS uh, in about 70% of patients. Depression can also manifest as So another question that I ask is, how's your mood? Do you have any stressors at this time that's causing fatigue? And then there are other medical issues that can cause fatigue as well. Anemia is one of them. Thyroid dysfunction is one of them. So all of those things can cause fatigue and it's easily mistaken as MS fatigue. So as a physician, it's my uh, um, job to tease out all the little nuances and try to figure out. Now, and, and some of those things can coexist along with MS fatigue and make that worse. So the first thing, uh, I talk about sleep. There are some MS symptoms that can impact sleep as well. Well, if someone has bowel and bladder dysfunction, if they're getting up four times a night, 
to go to the restroom, they are not getting a, a, a good enough sleep for the body to rejuvenate. So that is directly related to the MS, and I have to fix getting up to the bathroom four times a night in order to uh, uh, improve the sleep and in turn improve the fatigue, right? So if they're having spasticity, if they're having pain, that also impact how to sleep. Uh, they cannot get in a good comfortable uh, position. So I have to treat spasticity in order to give them a good night's sleep and then improve their fatigue. I tell patients, yes, there are some medications that we can give if you come and say I'm fatigued, but if we do not address the underlying problem, then you're going to come back and say, well, Dr. Kai, that medication didn't do anything for me. So those are some of the ways we approach and try to figure out what symptoms are MS related or not. And, and there are lots of other examples I can use. Um, back pain is one of them. You know, so pace, uh, MS patient may experience back pain, but some people may have degenerative changes in their spine. So we have to be careful not to label everything on MS and miss other conditions that may be affecting patients. So I always encourage patients, let's look at other things before we go and start treating for something uh, uh, that some symptom that may be a cause from something else. That's great. Thanks so much for that answer. I think Stuart has some questions. I'm going to mute and let him in. Hey, everybody, okay. I'm back. Okay, so great. So thank you for uh, the conversation, Dr. Okai, that we're having so far. Sounds great. There's a little hiccups in the uh, internet. So for everybody out there listening, I'm sorry that you're hearing this, but it should be like a sign of the times these days. Uh, some of the connections are great. Other ones, you know, it's weather conditions and whatnot can cause can cause these things. So we do have questions, though, that are relating to their first two uh, discussions that they've had. They, they started speaking about uh, disease progression and as well as different symptoms. And I do have questions to ask. So relating to something that you were asking about uh, or you were speaking about with smoking, one person wants to know, if there's, um, what did he say? I'm sorry, I backed up, I lost this for a second. Do you have any suggestions for helping quit smoking? Okay, so um, there are several ways uh, that people can go about quitting smoking. Uh, the first thing, uh, there are pharmaceuticals, so there are medications that uh, patients can get from their primary care physician, uh, and I said primary care because uh, as a neurologist, I leave that to the primary care who, uh, who a care physician who is well versed in those things. So that is, uh, so there are medications that patients can take for that, and there are different kinds. Uh, another way, another way, it's also uh, biofeedback, uh, mindfulness uh, that uh, in. Uh, in in uh, collaboration with a uh, medication can also help patients quit smoking. And, and there are lots of programs. Of course, there have always been the over-the-counter um, uh, aids such as the gum and the patch that they can use as well. But the, uh, there are a few other modalities uh, such as the one I listed that in Junction with your healthcare provider, mainly your primary care doctor, can help you uh, quit smoking. Okay, thank you for that. So one thing I'm going to ask: we have a lot of questions that have to be asked, and so if we can get short responses from you, would be great. I mean, great answers, but just slightly shorter responses. So we, because we're going to go through these questions, then we have more of your dialogue that you're having with Jill. Then more questions, more dialogue, back and forth. Great. And I want, I want to try to get in as much as we can. By the way, it's pouring here, so if the uh, if you hear any hiccups in the in the internet, it could be from that as well. All right. Next, okay. how much progression can affect if you're diagnosed with MS at an older age? Like this person writes mid forties, fifties, etc. So let's cut it, you know, just okay. as short as we can for each. 
So that goes back to what I said before, uh, compared to a 20 year old, uh, your functional reserve, so your brain reserve, you have more at 20 than you have at 40 or 50. So uh, if you're diagnosed later, the chances of progress, pro progression uh, is a little higher because you do not have as much reserve as he had at a younger age, and that can lead to earlier progression. Great. All right. So another person writes, how many years to remain on the same DMT? I mean, what's okay? And also, is it uh, is there an age like 75 to stop a DMT rather than remaining? I and mean, is there any, is, are they at any age where they must come off of it or can okay. they remain? So as long as your disease modifying therapy is working for you, your MRI stable, you're not having relapses and there are no clinical progression, there is no cutoff for you to continue on one DMT. Now, in terms of age and stopping medication, this is a new area for us. So studies are ongoing right now to determine when is a safe time to stop medication. But there are people who have relapses uh, at an older age, 60s and 70s, and there are some people who are stable, you know, for years when they reach that point. So that's something the physician uh, can determine based on your clinical history, whether to continue uh, uh, at a certain age or stop your medication, but we're studying that right now to get a definitive answer. Right, thank you. So another person wants to know if there's any uh, correlation to like being overweight or be not even being overweight, but just being a big person to say, um, and, and how that correlates to how they're taking their medication. Are there, is there another way to um, um, give a medication for someone that's 115 pounds versus 250 versus 300 pounds. Are there different um, ways that this is given to people? So right now, there's only, we have about 21 approved MS therapy, and there is only one medication that is weight-based dosing. All of our other medications is one size fit all. And, and the, the push right now is that with our therapies, our newer therapies, we can also look at that and see if uh, different doses are needed for people of different weight. Does that, is that the same with like uh, using a steroid? A uh, steroid is also one size fit all uh, at this time, the way it was studied. Okay, our uh, next, a person asking, thank you for those answers though. Uh, I took Lemtrot about three years ago, but I don't feel it's working. What would be the next step or option? Well, we have uh, multiple other options, and that's something that uh, you discuss with your MS doctor and see how they are going to approach. Now, I can't give a specific advice on, on, on a certain DMT, but there are other options that uh, you can go to if uh, after a certain period of Lemtrada and if you feel you're progressing. Thank you. Is there a normal pattern to disease progression that we should expect or be aware of, or is it like MS, MS itself um, and just there's different progression levels to different people? There is different progression level for different people. What we do know is that, what we do know for a fact is that people who are untreated, who then uh, aren't on therapy or, 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 or a, a something of that sort, they progress, you know, in a certain, in a, in a very typical manner. But for people who are treated, progression is different for everyone, just like MS. Okay, so I'm gonna ask one more and then we're gonna move back into the two of you speaking. And that one more was, I'm trying to find out the best one more that I want to do. Um, so they have, excuse me a second, everybody. I just have too many pages to go through here. All right. So some DMTs are for active SPMS, but if yours is inactive, should we, should we try a new medication? So most of the medications are approved for relapsing, active SPMS, and progressive MS. We haven't had one approved for non-active. Uh, we're looking at that, but 
your your healthcare provider can look at the different therapies and see if one would be appropriate for use uh, in in your situation. Great, thank you. So now I'm going to mute and Jill's gonna come back on and you two can get back to collaborating. Uh, I'm working on this, it's a project. Okay, we're gonna talk now about brain health and MS relapse. Can you uh, talk about MRIs in relation mm -hmm. to progression? MRI, so MRI is a picture into your uh, body. Uh, I look at it as a picture of your immune, what your immune system is doing to your body. When you're on uh, uh, your MS treatment, we really want uh, that treatment to slow down uh, MRI uh, activity, slow down new lesions from developing. So uh, when, when you are on treatment, we do MRI frequently to make sure you're not developing any new lesions because that can be a sign of progression as well. Um, sometimes you may have um, uh, MRIs or you may have symptoms and your MRI may not show any changes. That is not unusual because you have scars from before that can cause those symptoms. And then some people may have uh, may have MRI lesions and not show anything on the outside. That is not unusual as well because certain parts of the area, you, uh, the, uh, certain areas of the brain, you don't experience anything on the outside. But the main thing is is to try and slow down the development of new lesions on MRI, and that helps slow down progression. Can you tell us about the difference between white matter and gray matter lesions, and do they manifest them manifest themselves differently symptomatically? Okay, so gray matter that's how it looks on um, uh, looks uh, uh, in the brain is the body of your nerve, so your nerve cell body as we call it. And white matter is called white matter because that is the uh, stalk, so the uh, stem of the nerve, and is covered in is covered in myelin, and that myelin appears white. So gray matter does not have any myelin, and so it looks gray. And the uh, the stem of the uh, uh, neuron uh, is covered in myelin, and it looks white. So uh, when you have lesions in the white matter the conduction and what is conducting is what is affected. So you may be very symptomatic with it um, in terms of numbness, tingling, blurred vision. Uh, in the gray matter, because of the cell bodies, there are different connections all over the brain and it can, uh, there's not a specific uh, place that I can say, well, this gray matter is causing this symptom, but overall it affects every type of symptom because it's where all, all the information is housed that goes out to the rest of the body. Thanks. Do we have any questions about this, Stuart? Yes, of course, of course I, have I have questions. questions. I always have questions, right? So yeah, we got them. Um, we got them. We've got them coming here, right? So going back to what we're speaking about MRI. So person wants to know: Can MS progress without showing activity on an MRI? Yes, MS can progress without MRI activity. Okay, next one. So a person says: How can neuropathy or nerve pain be managed? And is this something that can be seen on MRI? So we cannot see nerve pain or uh, neuropathy on MRI. That's an electrical diagnosis. And then there are different therapies, symptomatic therapies, uh, as we call it, that are available through your healthcare provider to help manage that. And also make sure that there aren't other conditions such as diabetes or vitamin deficiency that are affecting your nerve causing the neuropathy. Okay, great. So about MRI, let's see. Um, nope, okay. We're gonna go back now. We're gonna go back to the two of you because we're done with the MRI from this portion. Thank you. Okay, okay I'm back. Um, can I just go back to that MRI issue? One more question from me. 
Um, yeah. You talked about the mm -hmm. residual. Can you just describe that a little bit and tell us what that means? Residual uh, reserve. I'm sorry, reserve. Wrong word. And it was an R okay. word. <laughs> so um, you, you are born, born with your entire set of brain uh, cells that you're going to have. So when you're born and you continue to mature with those brain cells up until the age of 20 to mid 20 at 30, after 30. So after 30, then that uh, uh, you start, those cells start to age and then they start to die off, just like any cell in your body. Once again, your full reserve of brain uh, uh, cells is available from birth until age 25 to 30. After that, it goes through the normal aging process where over time things just age and then disappear and go away. So at 50, you do not have the same reserve as you did at 20. So they do did not that regenerate? answer the question? Like a skin cell. So they do not, brain cells do not? No, so brain cells, brain cells do not regenerate. And if they do, they regenerate in, ineffectively that in, in your lifetime, you will not be able to regenerate what you have lost. So do we consider that shrinkage of the brain? Is that what people mean? Yes, you see, yes, you see it as shrinkage on your MRI report. It may be called atrophy, and that's a normal part of aging. It's just that with MS, it, it uh, atrophy occurs at a faster rate compared to someone who does not have MS. Okay, thanks so much. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, stem cell updates. Do you have some information about stem cell updates and HSCT therapy? Okay, HSCT, hematopoietic uh, stem cell therapy. Uh, so that there have been a lot of talk, talk about stem cell over the years, and HSCT has been the one that is promising or has shown promise in MS. And what it is is that cells from your bone marrow is taken out, processed, and 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 then reintroduced uh, in the body, so that with the hope of reducing inflammation and producing uh, 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 cells that may not be inflammatory as the one that was taken out. So that's the that's the uh, a process that we have seen right now that is working in MS. Um, so right now in the United States, there is a, a study at a few centers uh, that just started actually this year or late 2019 to study uh, HSCT in patients. What is important to, to realize is that HSCT or uh, stem cell therapy is not a cure for MS. It's, um, it's a treatment and it does it quite well from what we have seen and it does it for an extended period of time. There, there are still a few people who may have breakthrough disease and may need uh, uh, something else and some people who may worsen. But if, if it is proving to be as effective as we think it is, it will be a game changer because that will be um, a treatment that will last for a long period of time for patients. In your opinion, is it wise to seek treatment in another country? So it all depends on uh, first what is going on. Um, in the U.S., uh, things are highly regulated, and there are oversight uh, from uh, the uh, the uh, FDA and everywhere on how studies and how treatments are conducted. Now, I am not sure of what oversights there are. If you go South uh, South America or Russia or any other places offering these therapies, are there people that are are monitoring the activities? Are there people making sure that it's done in the proper manner? And then another thing to also uh, realize is that there are diseases in other country. And so if things aren't done in a sanitary manner, those disease, uh, those uh, infections and things that may occur, 
may come here and, and is something that we may not be able to treat. So it's, it's always a, 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 a good to uh, do your research. Make sure you're getting the first type of therapy. First of all, is it HSCT or is it something else? And, and if it is HSCT, something that we have shown has uh, to work, are they doing their due diligence in making sure that you are safe when you go for the procedure that is done in a sterile fashion and that there is good oversight for that? Great, thanks so much. We talked a little bit earlier about lifestyle choices. Is there anything that you might want to add about that and how medications okay. might affect how a patient lives? Okay, great. So we talk about lifestyle ch uh, choices, um, physical therapy and, and rehabilitative services is huge. And we have someone who's going to talk about that. So I will uh, table that for, uh, for, for later. But Physical therapy is something that, uh, or physical exercise, actually, let me say that uh, that way. You need to have some form of physical activity that increase your heart rate to uh, help your body is good, not only for MS, but your cardiovascular issue. You have to eat healthy. And most people ask about diet. Well, um, I tell them the, the best thing that you can do, and the diet that has been proven over and over to just be good for overall health is eating uh, the Mediterranean way of eating. So the Mediterranean diet, if you follow that, you are as close to most other uh, purported diets out there as well. I talk about the uh, smoking part, vitamin D supplementation uh, also is important. Most people talk, ask about different supplements. Should I take this supplement or the other? But I advise them, I'm like, well, if you're eating well, if you're eating fruits, vegetables, and everything that are, that's in there, then you may not need all those supplements. Because remember, supplements are also processed from the actual foods that you need to eat. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We're going to see if we have any questions. Hi. I say, oh boy, because of course, like I said before, there's always questions, but there are none right now with regard to the two topics you were just discussing, but I do have so many that I want to ask you anyway. So one person writes, are there studies being done now about patients for age 60 plus taking medications? And I didn't, well, you did speak about part of it, so she wants to hear it again from you. Well, what we are looking at, the, question, the original question was, uh, should patients in the 60s and 70s continue medication? So what we are looking at right now is for patients uh, over a certain age, which is 60, 65, what happens when uh, we take them off medication? So we are not looking at, at uh, new medications in patients over 60, if that's what uh, she's alluding to, but we're looking at patients over 60, if we take them off their MS medication, how do they fare? Do they need to continue or do they need to be taken off at a certain age? So going a little bit further with that, are there any studies, though, for people 60 plus on certain medications or to not do that certain? I'm a, not that I'm aware of at this time. Most of our uh, uh, trials in terms of investigational medications, uh, the cutoff age is 55 uh, uh, in majority of them. Okay, thank you. Uh, with bad cognition and other issues, it's so complicated to organize and clean that used to be, and do things that used to be so simple. And this person continues with, I get spasticity. Let's go to the portion of cognition first. Is there anything that you can tell her or him to keep better organized? So uh, prioritize and, and organization is make a list. Make a list, have a notebook, 
uh, or your phone, whatever works. Some people are old school, they prefer the notebook, other people prefer the phone. But make a list and make sure you check off things off the list. Prioritize what's mo uh, most important and do that first. And do it at a time when you have the energy to do that. Do it at a time when your brain is at its best and and you you tend to get things done uh, uh, better that way because it helps lead you uh, keep you on track track and lead you in the right direction so that's one way to keep organized great and then just going further so even with being organized though or, or helping to stay organized if a person ha who has multiple sclerosis has these cognitive problems, has issues with spasticity and gets it more often because they're also caring for somebody else. Is there anything that that person could do to um, make it, make themselves more mobile during the day? Do you know what physical, I'm saying? Reser reserving yeah. energy, I guess you could say. Yeah. So physical activity, stretching, exercise, Tysis, yoga is uh, yoga is a good thing for um, uh, spasticity, and it's important to incorporate that during your day when you get out of bed. You know, try stretching before you go to bed. Also, do stretching exercises, but incorporate one of those things in your daily activity to help with spasticity along with uh, talking to your doctor about pharmaceuticals if needed uh, in, in controlling that. Okay, great, thank you. All right, I wanna move things along here because we're, we're like only uh, 15 minutes away from letting our next speaker talk and so I wanna get you back on with Jill here, okay? Okay. Okay, Stuart stole my thunder because the next thing I wanted to talk about today was managing MS, and you talked some about organizational issues. Tell us some other special tricks that mm -hmm. people may be able to use to help with their memory or accessibility issues. Do you have any ideas about that that may help people? Okay. All right. So, yeah, so I talk about, you know, making a list, keeping it on your phone or having a notebook. Uh, to to help remember things. Uh, also, try to avoid overstimulation. If you think that uh, thought processing is involved, then try to do one thing at a time and avoid multitasking. Because uh, multitasking, then things get confused, and then uh, patients get frustrated, and then things don't get done. So, in terms of that, you will want to take one step at a time and, and get your task done so that you're able to process as well. In terms of ambulatory and, and mobility issues, so once again, if uh, you have to keep moving to keep moving. So if that is involved, I always tell patients at least twice a year, you know, get physical therapy and after physical therapy, make sure you maintain physical activity at home to help keep your muscle memory, to help uh, improve your endurance, and to help uh, uh, you continue to, to be independent as much as possible. You talked about um, making lists and somebody suggested to me setting timers on your phone. So a reminder of timers. Yes, of when timers as well, alarms. Yeah, that, that's helpful for people. Um, yes, alarms are great as well. Let's uh, talk some about communicating with your healthcare team. Um, okay. People seem reluctant about talking to their physicians about certain things. Um, can you give us any suggestions about that? Okay. Okay, so the first thing, know that when you are talking to your physician, you have a limited time with the doctor or the nurse practitioner or physician assistant, and you need to make the most of that time. So prior to going in, get a, a, a write it down, make your top three things that you want to talk to your physician about. And when you get in, in, in the office, in the exam room, make sure that is the first thing you talk about. You don't want to leave it until the end of the visit. Make sure that those things are addressed 
first of uh, the first thing, and they must be the important thing. As much as we want as a physician to uh, take uh, meet all the needs of the patient, sometimes you have to tell us what's going on. We talk about the visible and invincible symptoms. If I don't know that you are having bowel or bladder issues or spasticity, then I may not address this address that so you need to let me know now one thing that most people find difficult to talk about is bowel and bladder sexual difficulties and sometimes even cognition so um, what I do is that I have patients uh, uh, fill out a checklist and I have it there so if they check it off then I know I'm able to ask them that question and say, okay, are you having sexual difficulties? What is it? And sometimes some people want to talk about it, but just don't know the words to talk about it. And it helps if I just come up and say, okay, you are having sexual issues. What is it? And that, and they know that. And I, and I also try to tell them there's no judging in here. This is where you can tell and say everything and make them comfortable in opening up. And, and so I ask and I have to prompt them along to say, is it this, is it that, or what part of the sexual uh, uh, scope you're being affected? And then they're able to talk to me about it without them having to come. And then some people are just comfortable saying things like that. So in the area of telemedicine, I also, you know, patients are at home or they're around other people. I tell them, make sure you have privacy. So if you need to talk about some of these private things, you don't be embarrassed because someone else is sitting in the living room close to you. That's true. Can you tell us what, um you think the benefits of seeing an MS neurologist in a comprehensive MS center may be? And quickly describe oh, yeah. what a comprehensive, comprehensive MS center might be. So a comprehensive MS center is that you have an MS doctor, an MS neurologist, and then you have other specialists that you are uh, in the same facility or in the same system that you may that you have access to so uh, you have not only the neurologist you have the neuropsychologist you have the urologist you have the ophthalmologist so all the services can be provided by that one doctor and and in this system or in in the office so that's providing everything you need in the same system now, the advantage of seeing someone who only sees MS or MS specialist is that they have time and all they see is MS, so they have the uh, facilities, they have all the new information, and they have lots of suggestion and resources for you. Whereas a general neurologist, we're seeing other uh, disease uh, states like headaches or Parkinson's may not have have all the resources to offer you. So it's great that you have someone that is solely dedicated to your disease state and can take care of you. I, I advise if you have, I tell patient, if you had a heart attack, you're going to see a cardiologist. You're, uh, you, you're not just going to stay with your primary care doctor the entire time. So the MS, uh, the comprehensive MS center and the MS specialist can offer a whole lot more uh, to the patient and because they have the time to dedicate to the patient. Who is ultimately responsible for coordinating the information and sharing the information? And what if uh, the doctors don't share with one another? <laughs> So oh, yes, that's that's a great question. I, I, I advise patient that you, I set it up as a team approach. So the head of the team or the general manager of the team is the patient and the patient has to put the team together. They have to put the coach and the players together. So you have to get your MS physician and then you have to get your primary care physician. And then depending on the other symptoms that you're experiencing, if you need a neuro urologist or a psychiatrist or other specialists, all of that need to come together. Now, as an MS neurologist, and I see patients with different needs, and I'm in a comprehensive MS center, I can make the referral 
to the neuropsychologist or the physical therapist or the uh, the ophthalmologist and make sure that they have all the care that they need and make sure that I communicate with them. But there, as you said, this is in the ideal world. But if uh, that's not the case, the patient can also tell all the physicians, I need you to communicate with my MS doctor. I need you or tell me, please send this to my primary care doctor or my my urologist or my 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 psychiatrist. So it's a team approach, but ultimately the patient puts the team together and then secure the head coach to anchor anchor all of that. The primary care physician is important because they're the gatekeeper as well. Great, thank you so much. I think we have some questions and then we'll get on to our last subject. Sorry about that. We still have too many questions here. So before I get into that though, somebody reminded me to sorry, let everybody I'm talking too long. <laughs> somebody's reminded me to let everybody know that MS Views and News has this great patient tool for when you go to visit your, your neurologist and that's, you go to our website and it, there's a tool there. There's, it's not a tool, it's not a wrench or anything. It's a, a two-page document that um, you fill it all out and everything that you need your doctor to know about before your visit um, or your nurse practitioner or anybody you you um, you fill it all out and everything and anything about multiple sclerosis is on there so everything can be addressed before you run out of time now with virtual visits versus you know running out of time and the door closing behind you okay all right mm -hmm. person wants to know if getting esophagus spasms is common in MS patients? It can occur in MS patients, yes. And what yes. can they do for this? So uh, that's uh, treated with uh, 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 medication. So anti-spasms medication can treat uh, esophageal spasm. Great, thank you for that. All right, another one is, let's see, we have uh, people asking about um, a flare. They even want to know what an MS flare is about, if you could tell us anything about okay. that. Okay. Yes. So the definition of an MS flare, some people call it flare, relapses, exacerbation. The definition is that one, you develop a new symptom and it's continuous for more than 24 hours. And it, in the absence of fever, fatigue, extremes of temperature or overly stress. So uh, you have to have a new symptom that has to be constant for more than 24 hours, or you have an old symptom that come about and it's also constant for more than 24 hours, but it's not because of a fever, it's not because you overdid it in your fatigue, it's not because of extremes of temperature. Now, if you get symptoms 30 minutes here and an hour here um, and, and 15 minutes there during the day, that is not a relapse. Or if you went out and it was 100 degrees outside and you stay out too long and you come back and your legs are weak when they're always weak, that's not a, a relapse. You rest and it, it gets better. But something that is new and is in the absence of any external factors, that's what we call a flare or a relapse. Great, thank you. Tell me about comorbidities. Is a person that's asking, uh, saying that he or she has had many different diagnoses of different things and wants to know if it's being caused by the MS or, and if not, you know, will he or she be getting more different things going forward or? or what do they have to fear? Okay. So I'm not sure when it's a different thing, uh, what they've been diagnosed as, but so MS, I tell patients, MS come along with baggage. And what do I mean by that? You can have spasticity uh, uh, that MS causes. You can have urinary frequency that causes MS. But MS does not cause hypertension. MS does not cause diabetes. So um, MS doesn't cause um, a, a heart issues. So th those are two different things. Symptom-wise, yes, you, uh, MS can cause symptoms and you can have neuropathy, spasticity, certain kind of neuropath neuropathic pain. But in terms of diagnosis such as uh, diabetes, uh, thyroid problems, hypertension, those aren't caused by MS. 
Okay, one more question, then I'm going to turn it back over to Jill, and that is, how can I tell if I'm progressing from relapse remitting to secondary progressive, or how do they tell if they have primary? All right, so that's something that is manifested over time. And normally your physician will be able to tell. The thing is we have uh, such great medications these days that most people relapses are well controlled. And um, uh, so, but your physician based on your MRI, based on your clinical exam, and, and based on um, your, your, if you're having relapses or not, will be able to determine if this is secondary progressives versus relapse and remitting. Okay, thank you for that. Now, I'm going to let everybody know that if we did not get to your question, I greatly apologize for that. But there's just, there were just too many questions on here tonight. And we do have a second speaker. So we're going to have to say that if, if you have a question that was not asked and answered, if you could please send it to me by email. You do have my email address. So please send it to me by email. And I will send it to Dr. Okai and ask her to answer it. She'll email it back to me and I'll email it back to you, okay? All right, so again, I'm sorry for that, but I'm gonna let Jill continue right now with our last topic for the two of them to speak about and then we will go forward, okay? Thank you. Okay, we have the, the question of 2020. Can we talk quickly about COVID-19, please? Can you talk about um, the susceptibility okay. of MS patients specifically? And if you have any tips okay. for uh, general rules about safety and well-being. Okay, COVID, COVID-19, the subject of 2020. So uh, most people ask, am I susceptible to uh, uh, getting COVID? Well, just because you have the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis does not put you at a higher risk for COVID. The medications that we have patients on, which affects the immune system, and the goal of most of our MS medication is to lower the immune system. That makes them put uh, immunocompromised and put them in the high risk category. So majority of our medications do that, only a few medications do not. So any medications that compromises the immune system puts an MS patient at high, uh, in a high risk category. Now, most people say, well, if that is the case, should I continue my medication or get off medication? We do not recommend stopping medication. We recommend continuing medic uh, your, your, your disease modifying therapy because it's easier to uh, treat your MS and make sure you don't have relapses and progression. And then as opposed to uh, COVID-19, so the MS Society and all our international MS uh, organizations say stay on your medication, continue on it. Now, what can you do knowing that your immune system is compromised? Well, the CDC has a has a great recommendation, but it's something that you hear over the news all the time. Wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, uh, wash your hands, keep sanitized, keep a uh, hand sanitizer wherever you go if necessary, and and just uh, take overall infection precautions because that's the best way of controlling the virus. Large gatherings is, 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 a, is um, a huge uh, 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 spreader of the disease. And what is, uh, has recently come out is that one of the biggest risks is going out to a restaurant and, and, and have an eating in a restaurant. So it's something to also consider as well. But uh, wearing a mask, keeping keeping your hands clean, washing, sanitizing, avoiding large gathering is a uh, key to uh, preventing uh, uh, exposure to the virus. Great, thanks so much. I think we're gonna get ready for our mm -hmm. next speaker and I really appreciate all okay. your conversation and your great responses. Let me say hello to oh. Well, it was great talking to, uh, talking with you, Jill, and um, uh, I hope to, uh, and if there are any more questions, quite uh, Stuart, I'd be happy to answer them by email.
Great. Thank you very much for being online with us tonight. And uh, we look forward to being in Dallas, hopefully in 2021. I'm really hoping that um, everybody pays attention and wears their masks yeah. out there so we can possibly get rid of this thing already. Okay, but that's another topic. All right, great. Thank you for joining us. Now we're going to introduce. Okay, yeah. Yes, yeah. say hey, say hey, say hi, and whatever from Dallas, Texas. 